Thank you. Before I tell you the story of our research into the genetics of happiness, I would like to see a show of hands in the audience. Who thinks that your genetics do not matter for your everyday joy and life satisfaction? All right. Who thinks that your genes do matter in addition to any other well-known influences? You're making it slightly too easy for me here. So a majority, a vast majority of people actually said yes here. Now, that's truly quite remarkable because had I asked this question, say, a decade or so ago, I may not yet have seen a majority of people raising their hands. And that's because it's only quite recently that we've left behind this blank slate model of human behavior and emotions and started considering happiness not just as the sole product of one's experiences throughout the course of life, but also as the result of one's unique biology and genetic makeup with which we are endowed from the very start of life. So it looks like I'll be mostly preaching to the choir, but don't quite leave your seats yet because there's two things that you may not yet know. One is the precise extent to which genes may matter, and second is which particular genotypes may be at play when you're experiencing happiness. And those are precisely the two questions that my collaborators and I set out to answer and looked into. Now, before I report those results, I'd like to spend a few minutes of your time discussing why it's important to study happiness and where the research is currently at. Well over 2,000 years ago, I think it was Aristotle who first discussed the notion of happiness. And he stated that happiness is, is the most important purpose in one's human life. As it turns out, today, most people still think that that is the case. As in surveys worldwide, people will consistently put happiness as their most important goal in life. In fact, they'll put happiness before money, they'll put happiness before sex, and in one survey, I kid you not, they even put happiness before going to heaven. So people care about happiness. And happiness also made its entry into the uh, realm of politics. And I think it was Jeremy Bentham who best decided this, or best encapsulated this, when he said that happiness, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, should be the sole end and purpose of government. Now, Jeremy Bentham may have been an influential 18th century English thinker, and still took the British government a little over two centuries to pick up his ideas and uh, make them a reality. Because most recently, in fact, last November only, that the British government announced that they would start effectively measuring general well-being in addition to the well-known GDP indicator. Now, it's not just because people care most about happiness that politicians should put happiness at center stage in their policy making. No, it's also because recent research is starting to very, very clearly show that focusing in on one's happiness also has widespread positive consequences. And I'll give you a few examples. In terms of health and longevity, increasing a person's happiness by one point on a scale of five will have the same a positive beneficial health effect as quitting to smoke. Increasing a person's happiness will raise his, his or her productivity by, any, by any, an equivalent amount. And will lead that person to have a higher, sorry, a higher uh, um, salary or uh, wage later on in life. As together with Andrew Oswald we've recently shown is that happier people also wear their seat belts more often. And they will get less involved in motor vehicle accidents. I kid you not. And there's a very simple rational answer for why this would be the case. It's because happier individuals value life more greatly, will want to extend it as much as they can, and as a result, they'll try and avoid uh, physical risks in their everyday lives. Now, academic research, however, has mostly focused in on the determinants of happiness, i.e., what is it that makes people happy? And there, over the years, a number of very interesting, robust findings have come up. And I'll list a handful of those. Uh, first of all, money does matter for one's happiness. But it does so at a decreasing rate. And after a certain point, most recently figured out to be about $75,000, the effect of happiness no longer seems uh, to have any meaningful impact on one's positive emotions. And employment and inflation also matter. Now what's interesting here is that a one percentage point increase in unemployment has a stronger negative impact on people's happiness as does a one percentage point increase in inflation. Now, as you can imagine, if this is taken seriously, it will have some very serious consequences for anybody involved in economic policy making. Being married, the more married people report have higher levels of life satisfaction. 
as does having children, though this positive for parenthood effect really only seems to kick in after a while, according to statistics. Your, your friends and social networks are also very, very important. And as my collaborators, James Fowler and Nicholas Christakis have shown elsewhere, is that happiness is in fact contagious. It can spread, not unlike a positive virus, from or through your friends and your family and your neighbors. They also found that it did, did, sorry, that it did not quite spread through co-workers. Now, I can continue to list a whole series of interesting of these factoids about the determinants of happiness, but what these scholars have also found is that while these influences matter, they're not all that strong nor very long-lasting. And it has left psychologists mostly to start talking about a happiness set point or a baseline level of happiness which is unique to each one of you and around which your happiness seems to gravitate. In turn, this has led people like myself and my collaborators to start looking into genetic predispositions to see and find out whether genes may explain a larger part of the variation. Now, how does one try and figure out how important genes are for one's happiness? And ever since Francis Galton in the 18th century, have scientists and scholars looked at twins, not the movie, actual twins, to try and figure out what the divide is between the nature versus nurture question. The intuition here is very straightforward. Identical twins share 100% of their DNA together. Non-identical twins share, on average, 50% of their DNA together. So if we assume that these twin pairs grew up in similar environments, well then, if identical twins respond a lot more alike to the question of happiness than do non-identical twin pairs, well, in that case, we can trace back um, the difference in, in, in covariance between those answers, we can trace that back to the genetics of which identical twins share a lot more together. Now, that's precisely what we found when we studied over 500 twin pairs. Our identical twins responded a lot more alike to questions of happiness, of uh, positive well-being, of life satisfaction, as did same-sex uh, non-identical twin pairs. All right. Now, since Francis Galton, of course, um, twin studies have become slightly more sophisticated, and I'll, I'll skip the math and the uh, um, assumptions that are involved in all this, and I'll, I'll go straight to this result as visualized in this uh, Bayesian ace um, uh, Turner plot. Now, the result of our analysis is that 33% of the variance in happiness between people can be traced back to one's genetics. Had genes not mattered at, not, at, sorry, at all, then this ternary plot would have looked very differently. The result would have lied somewhere on that horizontal axis, flat, somewhere between shared and unshared environmental influences. Now, do note that um, other research teams also have had happiness heritability estimates by looking at twins, and they've estimated somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. So clearly, genes matter. But what twins do not tell us are the precise genotypes that matter for one, one's happiness, nor the neurological pathways that they may flow through all the way down to happiness. And that's what we set out to do next. Behind me here are our 23 chromosome pairs. If you were to line these all up, you'd see that they are made up of almost, or actually over 3 billion elements or base pairs. That's a huge number, but it's, as you would also know, we share almost 99.9% .9 of our DNA together. So it's really only in that 0.1% of our human genome that we can find genotypes that may allow us to try and, or may allow us and help us understand why some people may be naturally more happier than others. So now, how does one try and figure out where the specific genotypes may be that can be related to life satisfaction or happiness? And there's essentially two ways. One is to check all these little SNPs, which is a fancy word for all these points on our human genome where people can vary. Check all three million or so of them and try and relate it to happiness controlling for multiple testing. Or alternatively, one can look back into the genetics research and try and find out whether there are any candidate genes or genotypes that may lead us to think that they could also have a positive effect on happiness. And that's what we did here. That's the approach we took in this case. Turns out is that in terms of candidate genes, which is what I was saying, on chromosome number 17 lies an excellent fine candidate gene for us. 
And that's, it, the gene is called the 5-HTT gene, or the serotonin transporter gene. And that's because it encodes serotonin, serotonin transporters in parts of the brain that matter greatly for one's emotional well-being. Let's have a closer look at this chromosome 17, and the 5-HTT gene in particular. There it is, in all its glory. As you'll see at the beginning, in the promoter region, there's actually two possible variants in human beings. You can either have a short variant within the 5-HTT gene, which leads you to have to, which leads you to have a less efficient version uh, and leads to less serotonin transporters in those parts of the brain that matter for one's emotional well-being. Or alternatively, you can have a longer version at the start of this 5-HTT or serotonin transporter gene, which will lead you to have more serotonin transporters in those parts of the brain. Now, across our population, it's more or less equally distributed. But it does really quite matter which one you have because research has mostly focused in on the short version and has quite clearly shown now over time that the short version is kind of related to anxiety-related uh, traits and gives people a slight predisposition to um, depression. So what we did is not to look at the short, well-studied version, but we actually considered the longer version of this 5-HTT gene, the serotonin transporter gene, and I wanted to find out, hey, could this be related to happiness? And this is what we found when we looked at the genotypes for 2,500 people and then linked that up with the question, or sorry, with, the, with their answer to the question, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole, which, by the way, is a standard question in the happiness literature. Note first the good news, which is, of course, that most people seem to be answering uh, being very satisfied or satisfied with their lives. So that's great. But more to the point, of course, is that the, the relative proportion of people with these long alleles, with these long versions of the 5-HTT gene, increases as we move along in categories of greater happiness. The opposite is the case for people with the shorter versions. Now, these are just descriptive frequencies uh, and raw data, but more robust physical analysis very much confirm uh, the trend that you see here behind me. We also actually went out to look into a different data set that, that had this um, genotype information and answers to the questions about happiness, and we were able to replicate this result. So great, there's definitely something to this particular 5-HTT gene that's, important for, that's really important for one's happiness. Unfortunately, science is not quite at a stage yet where it can fully detail this cascade of interactions that may lead from this 5-HTT, the serotonin transporter gene, all the way down to one's happiness. But we're pretty optimistic that over the next few years, science will be able to provide you with a view that is more detailed and may look at the steps or the neurological steps in between those two ends. Now, all right, so the question to the, uh, to, sorry, the answer to the question, do genes matter for happiness, is a resounding yes. But there's a big but. And it's because your experiences throughout the course of life will remain the dominant uh, force on your happiness. So that long list, amalgamated, of the socioeconomic indicators that I mentioned before, those will remain the most important influence on your life. So it's very important not to interpret any, any of these genetic associations that we'll see often in the newspapers as in any way deterministic, even though journalists like to put it that way in their cover um, of, uh, of any article. And we've been uh, uh, subject to the same treatment. So, second point, however, to realize is that happiness is a phenomenally complex thing. And there are many genes out there. And in fact, there are over 21,000. And there are many SNPs, these little points of variation on our human genome. There, there's more than 3 million of them. So any one of these findings will have only a relatively small effect on actual, actual people's happiness. So again, we should not interpret this deterministically. So say, for example, the not too distant future, that you are being genotyped, and that they tell you that you have the short allele of this 5-HTT genotype. How should you interpret that? Definitely, you should not interpret deterministically and think that you're doing for the rest of your life or have been doing for, for your entire life. What you should do, however, is perhaps ponder the possibility that at times your neurological makeup may be fooling you into believing that your situation is slightly less rosy than it may in fact be. And hence, the knowledge of your own unique biology combined with your willpower may get you out of a small psychological dip at times. Now, in the event that you were to find out that you have the long allele, the long version of this 5-HTT gene, well, then I suggest ignorance is bliss, you forget about this TED talk. You may have, over, of course, realized that what I've presented here is somewhat of a simplification of the actual research, so for those that want to find out more, I would suggest that you 
um, look up our relevant publications on the web. Now let me conclude on a more generalist vision on how genetics may influence uh, the next decade. Know that the cost of genotyping is coming down tremendously, dramatically in fact, at a factor of two every year. By, sorry, it slashed, the price of genotyping is slashed by a factor of two almost every year. Which has led us to be able to genotype all those SNFs, those three million points in our genome that we may differ between us, for only a little over hundred dollars. This has led some people to start putting up their own personal genome on their walls as in something called DNA art. Now I do think there will be more important consequences of this wave of genetic information that's coming at us. And I'm thinking most notably, of course, of personalized medicine, where the promise is huge. And it's often set in that area that the person who will live to be 150 years old is already born. Now, this genetic revolution will also lead us to face some really tough questions on genetic discrimination, on genetic engineering. I never told you that this talk in happiness may have an unhappy ending. But what I can also tell you is that over the next decade, you, me, and society as a whole, we will get our heads around this genetic revolution, and in the process, we will learn a lot more about human behavior and happiness. Thank you.